the new list, the four soldiers, therefore, are Jafaru, W.O. Jafaru, uh, Bumura, Staff Sergeant Awini David, um, Sergeant Agbele, Prosper, and Corporal Bonnie Prince. This is it. So now, the question is that, if the people were there, according to the general, if the people were there because it didn't go through the right procedure, why then were they asking for a replacement of what is not there? You get the confusion? Why then were they asking for a replacement of what doesn't exist? Now, in any case, anybody who serves in the army, because these are their service numbers, 190195, if you, mention, if you go to the army records eh, and you mention these numbers, they can quickly trace who it is for you, like the police, like prisons. Everybody has it. Now, question is that, there is no single army officer in this country who by himself gets up to say, I'm going to protect the speaker. Because they all work in units, regiments, all of this organized. Whether they are in a section, they are in a, a brigade, whatever it is, they are controlled by somebody. Somebody will say, soldier A, soldier B, you are attached to this office, go. So now, when the general now is telling us that procedure was not followed, is it the case that the four soldiers just got up and decided that they were going to protect the speaker because they are related? Who moved them there? That's the question. So did the general not apprise himself of what had transpired? Because this was written on the 21st of January, 2021. He wrote his letter on the 11th of January, 2022, one clear year apart. So it took the army one clear year to realize that four soldiers had been attached to the office of the speaker without proper procedure. Is that what the army is saying? Because this it creates a dent on the military high command. This is a very powerful man in the army. This is a very powerful man in the army. I'm saying that there are five things we don't have to, uh, we don't have to politicize. Education, health, agri, security, and, uh, oh, that's, that's, I forget this word, finance, our economy. We don't have to politicize those ones. This, for me, smacks of a fish. Now, it had to take the national security the National Security Ministry, to write this. Now, they said the Ministry of National Security has taken note of the circulation of a leak correspondence between the Office of the Chief of Staff of the Ghana Armed Forces and the Speaker of Parliament on social media. Subsequently, the content of the correspondence has been misinterpreted. Listen to it. Misinterpreted. As an attempt by the executive arm of government to deprive the Speaker of the resources required for his full protection, the Ministry of National Security would like to place on record that, contrary to the aforesaid interpretation, all requisite resources, including logistics and personnel, required for the full protection of the Speaker have been provided. Question. There were four soldiers attached. They have been withdrawn. What space does that, does that create? That's my first question. Now let's move on. It is worth noting that for the first time since 2017, the security arrangement for both the Speaker and Members of Parliament have been significantly enhanced. I know that uh, uh, Members of Parliament have been given protection. Policemen, they follow them around these days. We see it. Even though we vote for them, we sometimes don't feel protected, but they are always protected. That's beside the point. But this question I'm asking is this. Is this the first time we're getting soldiers to guard a speaker? Did Speaker Okwe have soldiers following him? Did uh, Speaker Doa Jao have soldiers following him? The Speaker Joyce Bamford, I don't have soldiers following him. The Speaker, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, Anand has soldiers following him. The Speaker Hughes have soldiers following him. These are questions that we are asking this morning on Johnny's Bike. Share the, share the stream. Now, it's also need stating that personnel of Ghana Armed Forces do not form part of the security detail for the Speaker and Parliament as parliamentary security support is provided by the Ghana Police Service. Any need for uh, specific agency support is typically executed on a need basis in accordance with stated protocols. To reiterate, there has neither been a withdrawal of the security detail for the Speaker nor a reduction in the security strength of Parliament. The good people of Ghana are therefore entreated to disregard any unfounded speculation to this effect. Now, who is the Speaker of Parliament? He's the third in line. There's a president, there's a vice president. In their absence, it is the Speaker who acts as president. In his absence, the Chief Justice will act. So his right to say is number three. Now, number three, we are being told now, doesn't deserve to have military guards follow. A vice president is the chairman of the police council. His ADC is a policeman. But when the vice president moves, you see security, you see soldiers following him. The president is the commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. So rightly so, you see soldiers following him. Why does the speaker not deserve it? And you see, I'm asking this question because this is our electoral commissioner of the Republic of Ghana. Project this picture for me. This is our electoral commissioner of the Republic of Ghana. She has military guards. Not one, not two, 
not three, not four. She has military guard. When we saw it, when the, uh, what do you call it? When the court case was ongoing, just last year, the court case was ongoing. We saw them. We see how the first batch comes. They, they get down. They surround the place. They do their recce. And then the video is ready. Play the video for me. The arrival of the, of the uh, what do you call it, electoral commissioner in court. Play, play the video quickly. That's our electoral commissioner arriving in parliament, uh, in, in, at the Supreme Court. You saw the soldiers with hair. Great. This is our honorable attorney general. He has a military guard. In fact, the military guard was carrying his, uh, his files and the things until there was a public uproar and he stopped. But this is the attorney general. He has a military guard or he had a military guard. I don't know what the situation is now. And we know that there are many others who have military guards. So the attorney general is not number three. The electoral commissioner is on number three. In terms of hierarchy and precedence in this country, the speaker is number three. Now, what does the withdrawal of the four officers mean as far as the security of the speaker is concerned? That's the, that's the question we're asking this morning on Johnny's Bite. So how secure is our speaker? And is this, for example, in the public domain, the question is being asked, come back to the studio. The question is being asked in the public domain, is the security, the, the force soldiers has been withdrawn so that the speaker feels a, a bit uneasy to cower him into submission because the speaker has said notice that he will not be cowered into submission. He has said notice. So what are we doing? That's the first question. So Mr. Speaker, good morning to you. How safe are you? Because you have an important role to play. You are the superintendent of a hung parliament. A hung parliament that will soon consider the e-levy and, and other matters. You are returning on the 25th. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, how safe are you? That's my first question. My second question this morning, and share the hashtag, Johnny's Bite. Tweet at them. Let them know. Let's go to Adan. Now, there's something called the Songo Lagoon, which was designated as a Ramsia wet site, uh, wetland site of, of international importance sometime in August uh, 1992. Then in 2011, UNESCO approved the Songo Biosphere a Reserve as part of the World Network of Biosphere Reserves. Over the years, you would find that indigenous of Adan have constructed their own local ponds. They called it it's at Shaku in the Songo Lagoon, and they have mined directly inside. Scientists and environmentalists have complained. They say that that action has greatly disturbed the natural composition of the lagoon, as well as is led to the accumulation of huge silt and clay patches at some parts of the lagoon. However, for the first time in 40 years, 40 years, and I want you to know that, 40 years, fresh seawater, which is also known as brine, is now flowing to the Songo Lagoon for the making of quality salt. First time in 40 years. And this is happening under the, the uh, direction of Danado Danko Kufado, who are giving, uh, under the direction of giving their concession to uh, Electrochem, and then uh, gotten parliamentary approval and all of that. So until now, the lagoon was heavily silted and was at the verge of extinction. According to international best practices, the lagoon is only supposed to serve as a storehouse for construction of a concentrated salt uh, seawater and not a pan for direct mining. So, this new fresh restoration of the lagoon to its natural state was brought about by a company known as Electrochem. In less than one year, it's been operating in Adan. I'll tell you what has happened since then. But this, again, I reiterate, happened under President Akufadu 40 years on. Now, I know that there has been an attack on a radio station in Adan, and I condemn it in no uncertain terms because... I believe that no journalist must be attacked for doing their work. Journalism is not a crime. And if it happens to people and we don't talk about it, it can happen to you and nobody will talk about it. That is why we do Johnny's Bite. 
We speak for the voiceless. And I know that there's also been some kind of uh, a frosty relationship, if you will, between Electrochem and the people in Adan, Adan West, Adan East. Now, the frosty relationship is, as a matter of fact, that people think that because for more than 40 years, they have been doing their own kind of local mining in that shack, as I mentioned to you, the introduction of Electrochem in the area will, for example, take that away from them. I have had conversations with some town folks and our reporters who have been there. Joseph Armstrong has been there, and uh, I know Alfred Okansi comes from the area as well. But my findings have shown that there are dominant speeches of Leatherback, Olive Riley, and Green Turtles all along the coast of Adan. These are classified as endangered speeches globally. So I want to see how, for example, Electrochem can manage the chiefs and people of Lolonia and the Forestry Commission to actualize something that will protect the sea turtles along Lolonia Beach. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the brighter side. I'm not looking at who is fighting, who, who wants what concession, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking at a bigger picture because we've been complaining about jobs, 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 school, 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 uh, corporate social responsibility, all that. I'm looking at how that symbiosis can create that because, you see, sea turtles, they play a vital role in ensuring that sustenance of fish population in the sea by preying on jellyfish, which feeds on fish egg, sea turtles also described as ocean's lawnmowers, and they help to prevent seagrass from growing tall so that they don't harm other marine creatures, and it makes for good tourism. What we have presently, and which is now being restored, is not good for tourism. Because when you go there, I mean, flooding happens around the place, that place is under sea level and all of that. So the key question is that how do we make sure that the people are getting best from it. So education, for example, we do know that the best time to develop human brain is the first three to five years of their life. It's known as the formative years. So quality childcare and preschool experience during this time is very critical. How do we, for example, beyond fighting the company, ensure that Electrochem plans to expand the frontiers of corporate social responsibility to start building early childhood development centers in the area so that it can build the capacity of our children? So that even in future, we can have, for example, these children grow up to become managers of the company, which is within their domain. What about scholarships? How do we propose to uh, expand the present facility, as I, as I get to learn, that's been extended to certain brilliant but needy students to be educated? How do we take advantage of it? How do we get Electrochem to support and donate more to widows within their Adana state to support them? To, to sustain their own businesses, to make sure that they, are, they don't go begging, to make sure that they are not miserable. How do we get soft loans for many more women? Beyond uh, what I learned is 509 beneficiaries so far in a quest to get self-sustaining enterprises for them running. Open defecation. People are dropping their things, downloading everywhere. And that's where my findings say, so for example, there's a 20-seater uh, toilet facility at Lolonia, as we, as we captured. That has become a savior. Question is, how do we get Electrochem to extend the guest chap to uh, uh, Ajumani Kope, Boni Kope, Manche Kope, Nakom Kope, uh, Anyamam, Toflopo, all those places. How do we get them to, to expand it? That, for me, should be the focus. Yes, you can demand for what's right, but you see, when you are leaders of a community, and you start asking critical questions about what more your people can benefit from enterprises that are coming into your place. Because once Electrochem has come and the, the ecosystem develops, tourism develops, there will be more foreign direct investment. So how do we take advantage of it in the area of socioeconomic impact? What has the story been? And what is the story now? How many skilled and unskilled labor, for example, have been employed? If they are running a full scale, how many, people, um, how many of our people are being employed? How many of them will be roped in? How many will become fully uh, you know, self-sustained? What about sports? For example, it's a tool for youth development and engagement. How are we making sure that we get football parks, we get tennis courts, we get basketball courts, we get netball and volleyball uh, pitches, the athletic tracks, food court, gym, water. How do we make sure that we're getting all these things that we see at other places? How are we making sure? Shopping malls, clinics. How are we making sure that we are demanding from electric to say, you have come to set up here beyond fighting them? How are we saying, in the next year, we want this. In the next year, we want that. So these are the kind of conversations that must engage the minds of our leadership. How do we unearth talents and how do we make Adan great and strong again? That for me is the key thing. Now, we're wrapping up on this matter, but you also know that that Lolonia area is positioned 
as a low level area, susceptible to rains, high tides, sea as part of our community activities. How are we deciding that we create, for example, a dike that separates the Lolo, the lagoon, from townships so that villages close to the lagoon are not inundated with, with that flood water? The dike is averagely 1.5 meter high if you're looking at, at that situation. So it will, it will inure to the benefit of the people. I don't believe in fighting because, see, where I come from, people have fought for years over a small piece of land that could have been given to investors to say, oh, come and develop it and come and deal with the situation as we find it. But oftentimes we are more focused on, let me, let me hold on to it, let me grab it. This is a heritage. It's good. Let these questions engage you. Direct employment, indirect employment. Can we harness some more from Electrochem? This morning, I want to hear that conversation. How many productive community salt pans can we get them to construct so that even though they are running their industrial thing, we can also get them to do local pans for the people so that they don't lose their livelihood because that's their age-old uh, uh, employment. What kind of associated industry development and employment can we partner or them to engineer for us? In the area of alternative livelihoods, farming, fishing, particularly, what could be done about it? And you see, when the lagoon is restored, tilapia will come. All those other mud fish, all those other things will come. So how are we supporting to ensure it? How do we revive and sustain a useful lagoon full of seawater? Because I want to see it. I don't want to see the, the Lolo become like the Kole Lagoon. I don't want to see it. Social infrastructure demand. How is it? These are what I think you engage our minds this morning. Good morning. Now, let's, let's talk about ambulances. You know, we started an ambulance campaign on, the, on Thursday. Then we, we, trans, we tra, uh, transposed it to Friday. We spoke about ambulances. And you know that the, 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 there's a gentleman in Fijai who lost his uh, wife. Pull for me the, the uh, what do you call it? the letters, Oliver. Open the phone, I'll, I'll find it myself. Now, this whole ambulance saga has been engaging my mind. Now, I've seen also a writ suggesting that uh, Dr. Atoforsing is being taken to court with two others for what is termed as causing financial loss to the state in the matter of some ambulances that were supposed to have been procured. The deal started around 2010. By 2012, we had started and it's, go it's gone on and on and on. It's gotten cabinet approval, got parliamentary approval. We're told that the facility was ready. We started doing it. We signed the agreement. We're supposed to have started the delivery of the, uh, what do you call it, ambulances 120 days after and on and on and on. Now, what is the real story? This is the agreement that we signed. Oliver, open this for me. This is the agreement that we signed. This agreement is between Big C General Trading. And you can Google Big C. It's an international company, Big C uh, General Trading LLC. And the Republic of Ghana, represented by the Ministry of Health for the supply of 200 ambulances and related services, November 2012. Never mind that these days, when you have to use an ambulance, you have to pay fuel for it. But this is an agreement that we signed. So that we're going to get some more ambulances for our six. Now, these are the ambulances. We are told that there are 30 of them that have been sent in. These are the ambulances. The ambulances that have been sent. These ones. 30 of them. And the question we're asking this morning is, where are they? Are they sitting to rot away? 30 of those ambulances. Are they sitting to rot away? 30. This was when it was brought to the ministry. That's the ministry building. The Ministry of Health. For inspection. 30 of those ambulances. 30 of those ambulances. 30. Let us sink in. 30 out of the 200 that we agreed. 30 ambulances. Let's go back to the folder. 30 ambulances. So where are they? Now, the Ministry of Health had been led by the Speaker. Speaker Bagman had led the ministry. Then came Madame Sharia Ite. And then came uh, Mr. Alex Segbefia. So that was the, the period within which this was happening. It, it changed. Now, we signed the agreement. This is a letter written by, open this one for me. This is a letter written by Mr. Alex Segbefia. When he got in, he, he did an audit and he said he's asking for suspension of further payments in favor of Big C General Trading Limited for supply of 200 Mercedes-Benz ambulances and related services. It says the Ministry of Health signed an agreement with Big C Trading Limited for the supply of 200 ambulances and related services in December 2012. The total value of the contract is 15.8 million. The first consignment of the 25 ambulances were to be delivered 
by the supplier within 120 days after signing the contract. The remaining 175 were to be delivered in batches of minimum of 25 every 30 days after the first delivery. The company so far delivered 30 pieces of the ambulances. Where are the 30 ambulances? Where are the 30 ambulances? Now, it did not meet the contract, the specifications stipulated in the contract. Additionally, there is a disagreement between Mercedes Big C Trading Limited and the local agents concerning the supply for which the issues are being settled in court. That's Jakpa. In the light of these, we deem it prudent not to make any further payments to the vendor until the issues are resolved. We should therefore be grateful if you would suspend any more payments to Mercedes Big C the General Trading Limited, and we communicate to you other, until you communicate to you otherwise. Please find a target copy of the agreement and other supporting documents for your information. Thanks for your consideration. This is Alexander Segbefia. He was minister of a copy to the director of uh, legal services and all of that. Now, open the folder for me, Oliver. <coughs> this, is the, this is what he wrote first. Then Mr. Segbefia comes back and writes another letter. Open this one for me. Now, he writes another letter. Remember, that was dated in August. He writes another letter in December and says that we write to request for the establishment, note, of an irrevocable and transferable letter of credit for the rest of the 170 ambulances out of the initial 200 ambulances ordered by the Ministry of Health. 30 of the ambulances with all the accessories have already been supplied and to the ministry. The letters of credit for the remaining 170 ambulances should be established in the name of Jackpa at Business Limited in line with the order of the High Court Commercial Division. So you remember that in the first letter, we're told that there was an issue. Now that issue was settled by the High Court Commercial Division and a specific order was made. Please find attached a copy of the said order of the court for your perusal and necessary action, counting on your usual cooperation. We are trying to find where the 30 ambulances are. That's all we are asking. 30 ambulances. Where are they? Because there are supposed to be 200 ambulances. Now, there's a, a, something that I want to show you. In the contract that we signed, this contract, this particular contract that we signed, this agreement that we signed, in that agreement, it gives us an opportunity for dispute resolution. Listen to it. It says, all disputes arising in connection with this contract or the execution, therefore, thereof shall be amicably settled through negotiations between the two parties. That's the first one. Two, in the event that no settlement is arrived at, the dispute shall be sub substituted to the Ghana Arbitration Center for arbitration in accordance with the Alternate Dispute Resolution Act 2010, Act 798, or any statutory modifications thereof. So we had jurisdiction over it. In the course of the arbitration proceedings, the parties shall continue to perform their respective obligations under the contract with the exception of the part of the contract under arbitration. What did the contract say? The contract said that once we signed the agreement, once we signed that agreement, 120 days after, we start delivering the ambulances. And I've showed you pictures of the ambulances. Now I'm asking the question this morning, if indeed the company insists that they brought 30 ambulances in, where are the 30 ambulances? Where are, they, where are they now? Who has jurisdiction over them? And for example, what has this government done since they took over? Because government, we're told, is a continuum. Since the government took over, there's a contract between the Ministry of Health on behalf of government of Ghana and uh, Big C. Now, since the government took over, where are the ambulances? What have we done to them? Did we know about the Ambulances, the 200 that we have previously ordered before we bought the 307 ambulances. Did we not know it, what is the problem? Nobody is explaining. Now, they, 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 they open this one for me, Oliver, quickly, and then let's start wrapping up on this one. Open the, this one for you. There's an interesting correspondence between Big C, copied to the Ministry of Health, Mr. Kukwa Jimamino, because this is in August 2018. It's an interesting reason. Yes, I refer to our letter reference, number blah, 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 uh, 25th April, in which we stated that we, Big C General Trading LLC, was triggered, triggering the dispute negotiation clause of our agreement, what I just read for you. And the reference in the said letter, we further refer to the negotiations which were held between us and the Minister of Health. So Kukwa Jimamino is aware. And the technical team of the health, uh, Ministry of Health on the 13th of July 2018 as a way of resolving the dispute amicable. Now, following our understandings of the decisions and agreements arrived at during the negotiations and the reference here, Big C uh, agreed the followings. One, 
the supplier undertakes to send down a technical team to assemble and rectify any concern in respect of the 30 ambulances and officially hand over to the government of Ghana as a first batch of 50 ambulances accordance with the terms of the contract. Mind you, this contract was signed a long time ago. The deal said that 120 days after the contract had been signed, the first batch of the ambulances will be brought. 30, they have indicated that they have brought. Where are the 30? Why was the delay occasioned? Now, two, it says that this current agreement will be deemed to be an addendum, an addition to the original contract and to its terms apply with the appropriate amendments deemed to have been made to the original contract to reflect the new terms. Three, it has now been officially agreed that there will be a post-delivery inspection. Previously, the agreement, and we don't have a lot of time, but the agreement indicated that once they finish the ambulances, we will send the team here to go to Dubai to inspect them before they are shipped down. We failed to do that. In fact, we did the first, we did the first one, but we failed to do that subsequently. So, following that, we indicated that once they bring the ambulances here, we will go and check it. That's what the agreement they had with the Minister for to be undertaken by a joint team comprising representative of the Ministry of Health and those of the supplier for only the 30 ambulance vans and the accessories already in custody of the government of Ghana in conformity with clause 23 of the contract. This will only happen if the government of Ghana fulfills its part of the contract, including the current negotiated agreement. The supplier has agreed to maintain the original cost, even though we have delayed as goodwill to further absorb and not pass on the additional cost of the project involving the upgrade and most more costly model of the ambulances and their company. So they have agreed to take on that. And you know that they had an issue which was settled at the commercial court and all of that. First, upon the renewal of the establishment of the irrevocable and transferable letters of credit for the supply of the remaining 170 ambulances by government of Ghana, the supplier undertakes to also bear the full cost of the port and storage charges of the accessories at the port, including excluding taxes. So we agreed to this one, and it was signed, copied to everybody. This is signed by engineer Hamed Sadati. Now, the question I'm asking is that some, some people are being taken to court for causing financial loss to the state in respect of this. Commonsensical question, first one that comes to mind is that, was there even a loss to the state? If there is a loss, who caused the loss? And how long have we known that there's been a loss? Because I just showed you correspondences. What Mr. Segbefia had written to stop the payments. What he had written subsequently following the, uh, the court's direction that money should be paid. Now, we have also showed you a correspondent from uh, the Dubai company, Big C, to a minister for health. So he's aware. He cannot say he's not. Then we have also showed you the contract, giving us even space for arbitration in our jurisdiction. So now they insist that they have brought 30 ambulances. Where are the ambulances now? Because human beings need them. If you look at the UN ratio, we, we, what we have presently is not equal to it. What we have presently, one, one ambulance is supposed to cater for about uh, maybe 600 or so people. What we have presently is not, kept, is, not, is not taking care of it. So if we have ambulances packed, why are they packed? Because we will pay for them anyway, or we're waiting for judgment debt. So first, first question I'm asking is, was there a loss? Who caused the loss? It's okay to hold people accountable. But you see, once you start holding people accountable, and for example, within the same health sector, where the health minister himself told a bipartisan committee in parliament that he was not thinking right when he signed that Sputnik V deal, and he is not being held before a yoko, has not been taken to court for causing financial loss to the state, you start asking questions, what is the real motive behind these things? You start asking questions. You start asking very simple questions. What is the real motive? And this morning, I've tried to prick your brain. We need the ambulances. We are told there are 30. I've shown you pictures of the ambulances. Where are they? Who is keeping them? And is there really a loss? If there's a loss, who occasioned it? Government is a continuum. How are we making sure that we are following through to make sure that the good people of Ghana who pay taxes, whose monies will be used to fund these ambulances, actually get the full benefit of it? I've told you that things we can't politicize. Health, the economy, agri, education, security. This is one of them. And I'll stay on this matter and ask the questions. Thursday, we spoke about ambulances. Friday, we spoke about it. Monday, we'll speak about it. We'll continue asking the questions because the situation where, for example, you need an ambulance and you'll be asked to pay money for fuel is totally, totally unacceptable. Ghana is for all of us. And we must ensure that we get the best from it. 
Because you know, when they travel outside, they get better services out there. So why can we not get better services in our own country? Why? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Good morning.